Welcome to the Practice of Medicine podcast from the Southern Medical Association. Since 1906, SMA has had a singular mission, to provide medical professionals with the resources they need to learn from each other and in doing so improve the overall quality of patient care. The Practice of Medicine podcast is just one of the ways we do that as we discuss a wide range of topics including multidisciplinary approaches to patient care and new innovations in medical technology. To learn more about SMA's many other services and educational initiatives, please visit us at sma.org. I'm Dr. Lisa Fitzpatrick. And I'm Dr. David Melbridge. And this is a lot of the work that I've done um, over the past decade or so, uh, is focusing on starting with sexual history taking. And so I think there has to be an, an acknowledgement, particularly with primary care providers, to say, well, okay, um, you all have a, a, a number of things working against you in this system. Um, patients are being brought in and expected to be seen, and you're expected to address all their problems within 15 minutes. You're expected to do all these screenings of all these different things. And then we expect you to talk about pre-exposure prophylaxis and a detailed sexual history in that 15 minute span while you're also dealing with their acute issue, their other chronic issues and healthcare maintenance issues, which is damn near impossible for a lot of people to do. So I don't always blame the providers because the context actually puts them off their heels uh, with regard to having these discussions. But I think if we're gonna talk about PrEP, we actually, we actually have to start by talking about a sexual history. So I think any conversation or education or training of medical providers, particularly our primary care providers, um, and by that I mean internal medicine, family medicine, I even include OBGYN, we have to talk about taking a detailed and non-judgmental sexual history and really diving into that and then seeing what's going on with our patients, what their sexual histories are like, focusing on the aspect of pleasure with regards to sex and not just spending it as something pathetic pathological and saying, hey, you know, don't have sex without a condom or you'll catch this STD or, you know, hey, you know, don't have sex this way or else you're going to get HIV. But talking about, well, what does sex mean to you? Are you satisfied with your sexual life? What gives you pleasure? And then what can I do as a provider to help you um, stay on this level of pleasure and enjoyment with your sexual life while at the same time helping protect you uh, against what is out there in the world. And I think PrEP is one of those things where, you know, since 2012, we've had pills that people can take once a day. Uh, and that's worked very well. That's shown to be very effective in preventing HIV. But what's really exciting is some of the new data that's come out with regards to a, a long acting injectable version of PrEP. Uh, and this is an injection that people would take uh, if you're not living with HIV or you're HIV negative. You get a shot every two months. And in the studies that we've seen, both with cisgendered heterosexual women, with transgendered women, and um, with men who have sex with men, uh, most of the studies that we've seen have been uh, at least 50% Black and with uh, a significant proportion of uh, Latino MSM as well. We found that it's just as effective, if not better, uh, than the standard once a once a day pill taking that we do with pre-exposure prophylaxis for now. So looking forward to the That's future. That's really exciting. That's it's super very, exciting. It's very exciting. And I think it's not going to be FDA approved probably till next year. But I think it what it does is open the door and changes the conversation from defining PrEP as taking one pill once a day to rebranding it or actually more accurately describing it as pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP as a program uh, geared towards HIV prevention, but also a program to enhance and empower your sexual health. Because down the road, we have injectables that will be coming probably in about a year or so, but we'll also have things like implants. Uh, we'll also have topical gels. We'll also have patches and other things that people can utilize. So I think as we move forward, it's going to be about educating providers, not only on the sexual history, uh, a pill once a day as a form of PrEP, but also all these different things that are coming on board um, as options. Because as our patients move along, and if we don't have a cure for HIV, it's just going to be on our plates that we're going to have to get more educated and empowered in knowing these different options for pre-exposure prophylaxis and being, and being able to offer it to our patients based on their specific context. I so agree about the need to educate providers, but 
let's be real. We, we can ask providers to have those intimate conversations about sexual health with people, but it's going to take some practice. I mean, people, you know, doctors and healthcare providers are human too. We live in a society where sex is a dirty word and we don't talk about sex out in the open. We don't talk about this in medical school, in our training program. So I think we, we have to find creative ways to start introducing this and making it okay for providers to talk about it because sometimes they feel it makes them vulnerable to be asking such intimate questions about um, sexual history with patients. But I completely agree with you. Um, it, you know, it's, it's imperative that we do yeah, it. I, yeah, and I think one of the things that we can do is really leverage the power of social media and how social, and I know, you know the power of social media between YouTube and Twitter and different platforms, but being able to educate uh, providers and being be able to provide uh, medical education and medical conversations through social media um, is extremely helpful and extremely beneficial because not only, you know, we forget that, you know, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, medical doctors, we're all human beings. And so we do fall prey to the same level of discomfort about certain sexual conversations. And maybe we want to be trained or learn about this stuff on our own time, which may be viewing a YouTube channel and a, a viewing a video or doing uh, a CME course that's basically just being given uh, at the comfort of our home so we can watch rather than going to a big conference or having to be around a whole bunch of people or sitting in a classroom with a bunch of other people where you're uncomfortable doing that. So I think the power of social media, I think for a few years now, medical professionals and public health officials have been leveraging that, but I think there's so much more we can do about getting education to our providers as well as communities about this, because I think that's where the rubber meets the road, particularly with pre-exposure pro prophylaxis and HIV testing as we've, we've talked about before. Um, but I think giving providers options with their level of comfort, because I do think you're right, being real, um, it's not realistic to expect everyone to jump on board and get comfortable with having sexual discussions overnight. That's not gonna happen. Just like it's it's not going to happen that you would expect someone who's been a racist all their life to all of a sudden embrace racial equity uh, among all people. So you have to be able to give options where people can be trained, learned, and empower themselves in, in these kind of spaces. We hope you enjoyed the practice of medicine. For more episodes in this series or SMA's The Business of Medicine podcast, go to sma.org forward slash podcasts or subscribe to us on iTunes, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more information about SMA's mission, please visit sma.org. And thank you for joining us.